I think it's time, it's time right? Um, so, I guess everybody will come down, um, but the, um, we should continue. And we have the, uh, the last uh, session of, of scheduled talks now. And uh, it will work slightly differently um, because you see three people already uh, at the stage and it's not uh, a panel discussion yet. So we have, uh, we have a, a segment on, on, uh, on the, the, I think every, everything related to the Dataverse uh, um, uh, system. And, and so we have three people in a longer, in, in a longer talk, so I'll introduce all of them um, right now, simultaneously. So we have uh, on the left, um, Philip Durbin, and he has worked full-time on the Dataverse core development team for, uh, for over a decade, and is part of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science uh, at Harvard University. And then uh, in the middle, we have Oliver Bertuch, uh, and he's a research software engineer working on solutions for managing, publishing, and archiving research data and research software. His passion is bringing these two worlds together to promote open science and reproducibility. Based at the Central Library of the Research Center in Jülich, he works closely with the institute uh, uh, that I mentioned before in, at Harvard as part of the Dataverse core team. His focus there is on issues such as containerization, research software, readiness of Dataverse repositories, um, and as a copy of Helmis, he is developing a new key infrastructure element for automated metadata-rich research software publications. And uh, in third position, we have Jan Ranger, and he's a skilled professional holding a Master of Science degree in biotechnology. And since 2021, he's been working as a PhD student and research software engineer at the Cluster of Excellence Simulation Science at the University of Stuttgart. Uh, Jan actively contributes to the areas um, of data management and biocatalysis. Yes. Um, with a strong focus on big data and promoting the reproducibility of simulation data. Jan's contributions to the scientific community include the development of the data format Enzyme ML and Easy Dataverse, a Python library that facilitates seamless interaction with Dataverse. And with that introduction, I hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for the very nice introduction. Like we were saying, we sort of forgot what we had written. Um, maybe I should have added that I'm also a user of IkiWiki, uh, another Joey Hess original, So, uh, and I'm a Git enthusiast. I was very proud to be one of the few to raise my hand when it was asked, who's heard of Git Force Push with Lease? I was like, yes. Although I only heard about it like two weeks ago. Um, command line junkie. Uh, I've heard of inodes. I feel like I'm in the right place, the right crowd, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, oh, and by the way, this is, uh, you mentioned IQSS at uh, Harvard. Uh, this is like the headquarters of Dataverse, this round building uh, underneath Jan's name. So I just thought I'd give you a little picture of uh, the other Cambridge. Cambridge is distributed just like Bristol. This is the one across the, the river from Boston. Okay, uh, here's our agenda. Uh, we're gonna talk about what is Dataverse in the first place. And then, because this is a distributed data conference, I thought let's talk about the way the Dataverse distributes data, especially metadata. So we'll talk about OAI PMH, which we heard a little mention of in the one data talk uh, from Lucas yesterday. Uh, we'll get into distributed data, uh, Dataverse and data lab. There is a relationship here. And then uh, we'll hear from Oliver and Jan on uh, future architecture, mixed style storage configuration with ULIC data, and uh, PyDataverse, use of Dataverse APIs, so good stuff. Okay, what is Dataverse? Um, Dataverse is open source research repository software. Uh, there are 116 installations of Dataverse around the world across 36 countries. We run it ourselves, we eat our own dog food at Harvard, uh, Harvard Dataverse. What might be unique about Harvard Dataverse is that there is an open invitation to free data hosting for your research data. Uh, up to one terabyte. So if, you're, if that sounds of interest to you, please get in touch or just create an account and start uploading data. Um, let's see, I thought I would, oh, and then of course Dataverse is, is a community. Uh, this is a picture from our uh, annual meeting uh, that took place last year in Braga, Portugal. Uh, Jan and I just got back from Mexico uh, about a month ago. Um, that was the 10th annual conference. And you're welcome to join us next year. Uh, uh, we'll be at the University of North Carolina in the States. 
Uh, and then I thought I'd just give you a visual of uh, what a data set looks like in Dataverse. So this is actually my data set. It's not a fancy, important data set by any means. It's just me um, trying to figure out what's going on open source-wise at Harvard, because I'm a big open source enthusiast. So um, down at the bottom, you see some files, uh, a Python script, and then my, my tabular data, and then my primary data, which is just a bunch of uh, JSON files uh, that I downloaded from the GitHub API. Oh, uh, I was just talking to Julian, who talked about zip files earlier, and there's a nice feature of Dataverse where uh, we support the HTTP range header, where you can say, I only want the bytes from here to there, like maybe the middle of the file. And folks came along and built, some, some community contributors built a tool on top of this that we call the zip preview or download loader, so that you can click on this file, then you get a graphical view of all the files inside the zip, and you can just click and say, I just want the readme, or I just want this one file in the, in the middle. So it's a nice little feature uh, to mention. Um, yeah, speaking of tabular data, uh, we have a lot of support for it uh, in the sense of we will try to what we call ingest the data so that and if, if, ing if ingestion was successful, then you'll be able to see the number of variables, the number of observations, and you'll have access to a bunch of uh, tools for exploration of that data. Um, so uh, you would click the eyeball, for example, and see um, a preview of the data and maybe uh, uh, tools to explore. This little robot thing is a new tool from my boss. Uh, it uses Langchain and uh, OpenAI to uh, give you a hint of what the data might be about. So it'll read in the first rows and variables and, uh, and try to guess. And then you can follow, it gives you a prompt, you can follow up with further questions about what, you know, tell me more about this data. Um, I'm only using the, the, the bare minimum of um, fields, uh, title, author, description, subject, uh, but uh, there's a lot of support for uh, custom metadata blocks. So it could be any field of science, uh, we've had structural biologists come and create their own uh, blocks of metadata. Uh, you can make a neuroscience block if you want, uh, as many fields as you want, drop downs of all the different uh, vo vocabulary you might use. Um, oh, and one more thing to mention is um, in Dataverse, files can have files. We call them auxiliary files. So uh, for any of these files, I could upload as many files as I want, small ones, big ones. Maybe I want to upload more metadata. Maybe I want a readme per file. Uh, we also made use of this functionality recently uh, for HDF5 files, or also NetCDF files. When you upload them, we grab the header from the file and then store it as an auxiliary file. So if you don't want to download the entire HDF5 file, you could just preview and see the, the header. Yeah, so I think that, that's about it. Um, a DOI, of course, is one of the main features of Dataverse. Um, you, a DOI is sort of out of the box the, the, what we expect you to use, but if you install Dataverse at your institution, you might also choose instead handles or something called permalinks, which is basically just relying on your own DNS. Um, yeah, dataverse.org, so you can check that out. Um, there's a long list of features at this URL, software features. Uh, I'm going to try to talk about a few of them that I sort of highlighted, and, and I'm, as I said, uh, OAI PMH will be of interest to this crowd, I think. Um, but you know, past embargo and you know, restricting files. This page goes on and on. I, I just wanted to give you a, a sense of that there are lots of features. Jan and I were talking about how you know we do support the Open API specification, and now we can get a list of how many APIs do we even have. And the answer was 345. Yes. So that should give you an idea of like how much functionality there is in Dataverse. Like 345 APIs you can hit. So have fun. Okay. Um, oh, and and uh, because I can't, I don't have time to talk about all the features and whatnot. I thought I'd just sort of highlight a few. Uh, videos on Dataverse TV, especially recent ones that go through features. So um, fair data, of course, uh, data handling, uh, meta, how to do metadata, and, uh, and intermediate curation of metadata. Uh, here's a fun one, uh, bringing data close to, to compute at Harvard Dataverse, I would recommend, and uh, introduction to Dataverse APIs. So you can check out all those videos. Okay, distributed metadata. Um, one of the main uh, reasons for Dataverse to exist is to make your data discoverable, right? Um, so we do this in a variety of ways. Um, I'll go through some of these points. So data site, if you're not aware, is, a, is sort of a place where we as a repository can push information to declare, here's the, the title, the description, 
author license all this information about data sets and people can search data site for data. Um, we'll get into OAIPMH in a second. And, but then I wanted to also mention, uh, especially under machine readable metadata, the schema.org JSON LD metadata. So we developed this uh, talking to Google because they said we're about to launch this Google dataset search thing soon. And they explained it's pretty simple. You're just going to have a site map that has all of your data sets in it. We're going to crawl your site, and then we're going to look in the head of the HTML for this specific JSON file. And they explained what the format will be. As I mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, they're changing to this new format called croissant. So um, pretty soon, I'll think I'll just say croissant. It's a lot less to type. Um, but it's just a, a way to uh, get the word out about your data. It's a way to, that. Um, if you make it easy for crawlers like Google to, uh, to find and discover your data, then, then others can find it more easily. Um, I, think, I think that's good. We'll move on to OIPMH. So one of the main points is that this is a standard protocol, right? It's um, not something we invented, but it's something we support. And we love standards. Um, this means that uh, we can harvest from any uh, service that uh, is using this protocol as well. They can harvest from us. So I just think uh, in the context of a distributed data medium like this, this is a great thing to know about, that I don't know if this is a big part of your world or not. Again, we heard that one data supports this as well, which is great. But you know, maybe uh, there's neuroscience data that people would be interested in that, oh, we'd like this to be part of Harvard Dataverse. You know, if there was a system out there that supported OAIPMH, then we could certainly harvest that. Um, this is the details of how it works. You're basically listing identifiers, listing formats, pulling records, that sort of thing. You're advertising sets of data. Um, yeah. This is a complete uh, fiction of, <laughs> of who's harvesting from who. But just to give you the idea, um, I think we'll see in a second it's either 29 or 39 uh, clients for Harvard Dataverse. So we are harvesting metadata from all over the world all the time. Um, but just to give the idea that um, you, know, you can harvest the data that's interesting to you, you know, you can say, oh, you can look at what sets they, they offer. Oh, this uh, set is the same research that I'm interested in. You can pull all that in. Right, so there are two sides to this, the, the clients and the server. I guess it's 29 clients. Um, and so you can see that we are harvesting, this is Harvard Dataverse, we're harvesting over 82,000 data sets. So this is just the metadata. This is just for discoverability. So people can come to Harvard Dataverse and search for data. They can find data that's not just locally hosted by Harvard Dataverse, uh, but data sets all over the world. Um, yeah, our, fr our friends in Canada, that's the, the Borealis uh, data.ca. So 19,000 data sets just from them. And as I mentioned, there are various formats. So the, the most basic format for OAIPMH is Dublin Core. This is a very simple format that just gives you the title, uh, the creator, the author, um, description, that kind of thing. And then uh, there are much richer formats, um, DDI, uh, data site formats. Um, if you're harvesting from, from Dataverse to Dataverse, you want to choose this Dataverse JSON format because then you get all the metadata. Even if you've created your own metadata blocks, as long as they uh, have the same blocks installed on their side, then you can get all that rich metadata across. Harvesting sets. Um, yeah, so uh, you can just harvest everything, but sometimes you want to slice and dice your data and offer different sets, different combinations of data. Um, one thing we've had people ask us at Harvard Dataverse is, well, a lot of my researchers have data they've deposited with you. Can you create a set of just my just the professors at uh, the University of Virginia, say. And we say, yes, of course, so we'll create a set just for them. That way, from there, they also run Dataverse. So fr from their uh, installation, they have all the data from their, their um, PIs locally, and the, also the harvested data from us. And then this just gives you a sense of how it might look. Um, I, I type the word uh, distributed to see what would pop up in Harvard Dataverse in about you know, 6,000 or so results. And uh, almost, uh, or about, I guess, yeah, uh, half of that or so is, uh, is harvested metadata. So it just really increases the, the reach of your data to have it be harvested across various systems like this. The, and then just to note that it, it is a you know, mature protocol. It it's, was last revised in 2002. Uh, you might be wondering, you know, given the age, is there anything newer? There is something newer called uh, 
resource sync, but we haven't looked into it very deeply. Uh, we've been pretty happy with OAIPMH, and our community seems to be happy. So, um, you know, why why switch if if we're happy with what we have? Okay, now I'd like to get into distributed data. How am I doing on time? Mm. You've been busy, busy for 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay, I'll try to buzz through this stuff then. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess um, originally we just had a simple way to store files uh, uh, just on a file system. Uh, very popular these days is, is using S3, so it doesn't have to be Amazon S3, it can be any compatible S3. Um, and then we're uh, starting to see uh, usage of uh, sort of remote files where like maybe in, in the past we've already considered ourselves an archive where we're taking care of the data and uh, calculating uh, checksums and we are keeping the data for decades, right? But now we have a new idea that, okay, it's fine to have the file somewhere else, especially if it's large or if it's sensitive and that's this trusted remote storage. And we're also exploring the use of Globus if you've heard of that for a file transfer. Um, I'll just say uh, there have been uh, some interesting stories over the years. Uh, this is a group at Harvard, um, structural biologists, and they had uh, they, they do have uh, data replicated around the world uh, in the U.S., Sweden, Uruguay, and China. Now they're not using Dataverse, but these are the kind of people that will come to us and say, you know, "This is what we're doing now, and we want Dataverse to do this for us." Like if we move to Dataverse, we still want this, we still need this, and so this is sort of like a challenge to us <laughs> to uh, to get this working. It's part of why I'm here. And then another uh, story is just an uh, uh, installation. They're not on the map yet. Uh, they're in Asia, and they are basically have a very generous offer that they could mirror data from Harvard Dataverse, and maybe we could do the same, just for like CDN-type purposes, just to have the data much closer to the people downloading it. So it's another challenge. We're still thinking of how we might do this. Um, I don't know a lot about all the AWS services, but my understanding is that you might be able to use something like CloudFront to um, have people download data much closer to themselves. Uh, we may or may not stay on S3, so I'm not sure if this will be an option for us. Um, someone gave a talk from StoreJ at a recent one of our meetings, and I guess this is out of the box how it works with them. You know, they're compatible with us because they're compatible with S3, but in this case, they distribute data around the world, so this could be a solution for CDN, I don't know. Um, and then finally, I want to get to Dataverse and DataLab. <laughs> so Yarek has been hanging out in the uh, Dataverse chat rooms for a while. I think over 10 years, I, I looked, it was March uh, 2014, so appreciate <laughs> that we've been talking so long. We finally got together at FOSDEM in 2020 and said, let's integrate. And um, yeah, Be uh, Benjamin is the one who, who wrote this code, uh, this link on the left, this uh, extension. So um, from what I understand, you can, uh, add in this extension to Datalad and push data to Dataverse. It will give you a DOI. And yeah, I'm happy to uh, hack on this during the hackathon tomorrow. Okay. Next is Oliver. Thanks. Okay, in order to stay on time, I'll uh, start at stopwatch. Um, yeah, as... Uh, Michelle already introduced me. I'm working at a central library, and we're having our own installation of Dataverse, which is called Julich Data. Um, Julich is, or, or the FDJ is always very um, creative when it comes to names of services. It's always something like you or Julich or whatever. So why would we be different? Uh, and what is Julich Data now? So this is what the, the header would look like if you go to datafz julichde and uh, we started in 2020 with this installation. And what we wanted at the time is, OK, we need a data registry. Um, I'll come back to what that means in a bit on the next slide. Uh, but first, um, the show running is uh, happening. Or, or we are the showrunners at, at the central library. So we are using resources from our IT department but we are not like a scientific institute or something, but we are like people from a library who know a thing or two about metadata. Uh, and we have an open science team, and we are obviously doing this for the whole of the campus, which is about 2.5K researchers. Uh, the FCJ is about 7.5K people, um, actually, as a staff. Uh, and so far, we've tried to uh, go with a zero storage policy 
or more, let's say an ideal. So the publication personas we were currently targeting is uh, Alice and Bobby, because Devon, well, sorry, but I can't help you. Uh, and Alice is rather common, actually. Um, so we heard a lot about people using gin and neuroscientists pushing stuff to gin and stuff like that, or to e-brains. And so I understood that uh, there are people out there who are required by funding agencies to push something into e-brains, but we also need kind of the information, okay, there is something out there, because we need to report to the Helmholtz Association, which the uh, FCJ is a part of, to receive money from them. So we need to report, okay, here's these many data publications, they are associated to these institutes of ours, and they are associated to these research topics within Helmholtz. And so we somehow have to get these numbers, uh, these numbers, and usually the external data repositories do not track such institutional metadata. So there's really no way around the, than having some kind of registry and making people enter this information. The other use case is uh, Bobby, which is about doing a metadata-only publication in Jewish data. We do have a lot of people that have especially large data. For example, in the GSC, there's a service called DataPub, uh, datapub.fz-judish.de, and they are hosting a few hundred gigabytes of data. And as we are having a no storage policy so far, there was no place for this. But they also wanted to have a DOI for this to make it fair and citable and all the stuff that's usually associated with that. And so we said, okay, let's create a metadata application in Yiddish data and uh, just have a pointer to the actual storage location. Um, this might be a good idea for a lot of things, like if you cannot share the data because of uh, privacy, size, or policy reasons, whatever the policy might be. All right, so lessons learned from this is, um, well, we started in 2020, and right now we have 150 published data, set, published data sets in Yulish data. That doesn't sound right. That's kind of, that's not the truth. <laughs> Something is clearly wrong here. So we learned definitely that um, the obstacle of having to, to register the metadata twice, once at your, like, the location where you're supposed to do it because you get money from this, and in addition, like from some kind of third-party funder, and in addition uh, in Yiddish data to get money basically from Helmholtz, well, that, that makes people very unhappy, and they are kind of reluctant to do that. And so far, it seems like it still works for them. They, everybody's still happy, no one gets any budget cuts, obviously, but Maybe we should change that. Uh, what we did achieve in the meantime is that we are well established as addressees for RDM questions. So people come to us and say, hey, where can I do this? Where can I do that? But unfortunately, there are questions about storage. And we usually have to turn people away like, OK, so please take a look. Does your community have some kind of uh, large publication thingy? or?" Any other solution? Maybe Zenodo is your thing? I don't know. Um, and then come back and register. So hmm, not really a good thing, because that very often leads to this uh, situation where people say, oh, this is so complicated. I don't have an easy solution. So they either go for, OK, let's build our own, or I don't care. I don't have time for this. Thank you. Goodbye. And uh, the next thing. Um, when you look at data sets in Yulish data that are metadata, publi metadata only publications, is they look rather empty and deserted. So you don't really know like what's going on here. Is this a real thing or some scam or whatever? Um, and that is mostly because these metadata only publications don't allow you discovery of what does the data set look like? What kind of files are in there? You have more or less zero discoverability. And that is also not a good look. And last but not least, um, the SRJ joined SFDORA, which is the San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment uh, in 2023. And so we do also need to look into how can we make software publications happen? Because Dataverse is currently kind of limited to or focused uh, on uh, data publications. And obviously, that would need some work as well. Six minutes. I'll try to hurry, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so we have enough time. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so when we started with this, someone had a talk yesterday, I'm not sure who it was, who talked about that uh, infrastructure needs governance, needs policy, needs to have good upfront design and decisions because usually when you're designing the infrastructure, you're doing it in a way for the purpose you're trying to solve. And obviously, the purpose might have shifted now a little bit because we don't need just to support Alice and Bobby. We might need to uh, have the option to give people storage. And our infrastructure is currently not capable of handling that. So we definitely need to look into uh, creating a new platform for this. We have been running on Kubernetes uh, ever since we started to build the service, but we should reduce uh, this a little bit because we will need more computing resources when you're starting to ingest uh, actual data and not just metadata. Uh, we also uh, did a lot of contributions, which is why I'm on the core team, to Dataverse itself, and so we want to migrate to the, uh, our upstream contributed containers, and we want to contribute a Kubernetes operator for the management. And if we're talking storage, how much storage are we actually talking? What kind of storage do we need? Um, a terabyte, 10 terabytes, one petabyte, 100 petabyte? I don't know. Uh, we heard yesterday from my colleague uh, Julia Tönnissen, there might be a need for larger storage, but do we want a copy of this or is there some other clever way to do this? So uh, let's do a lot of structured interviews with people around the campus to learn about people's needs um, so we can start to like build a solution that fits actual needs and not just some technical play playground. Yeah, um, I do hope to be finished with the infrastructure updates by often 2024, but there is more because we do need features. Feature updates. First of all, um, regarding uh, challenges regarding the support of Alice, who wants to do just registrations. Sounds easy, but currently Dataverse um, has the focus on being an archive, as you already mentioned. And we do have that option now to uh, also uh, like ingest remote files, but that's that's nice, very very nice to have a nicer representation of you publish somewhere of what you publish somewhere else. But that does not solve this, uh, the the problem of how do I get the metadata of the external publication in here? You already heard about harvesting, but that has its limitations. If you're fine harvesting all of the nodo, great. But maybe you don't want to add the institutional metadata to all of the nodo, just to like a few tiny bits of the nodo, or eBrains, or one of the other thousand community repositories that might be out there. And maybe they don't even provide an OIH PMH thing. So uh, what do I do here? So this definitely requires us to change how Dataverse works. We need something that does allow harvesting of metadata, but still allows us to edit this metadata. Because we might, for example, have different requirements. Maybe it's not enough for us to say, uh, my name is Bertuch, uh, uh, comma, O. Maybe we want Bertuch, comma, Oliver. And maybe we also require people to have an ORCID. And maybe the external data source uh, for, for us, it would be a source, doesn't have an ORCID because they don't track this kind of stuff. Uh, so what to do here? So there's a lot of challenges here that might be also uh, something that um, uh, some kind of large language model with a uh, retrieval augmented generation might help with because we do have other sources for this kind of metadata. We do have already a lot of knowledge about the people working for us, so we could uh, identify these people, identify which institutions they work on, what topics they work, so we could make educated guesses and suggestions to people. And we could also like crawl all of the nodo and say, oh, this looks like, like someone's from Jülich, maybe send this, this person an email, hey, I found this, I've enriched it like that, would you like to add this to Jülich data? Because that's ultimately what people want, right? They would just want to click on, yes, thank you, I'm done. So we'll see about that. Um, this, so this metadata uh, uh, ML thing, this won't happen in 2024, but what we definitely need is uh, the technical support in Dataverse to allow like some harvested metadata set that is still enrichable with other metadata. Uh, and we will need something like the, the version PID so that uh, 
a version can have a persistent identifier, as well as other types of, of things like software and not just data sets. Oh, 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 I need to speed up a lot more. Uh, challenges to support Bobby. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, so uh, Bobby, basically, this is something, um, I've talked about metadata only, but maybe we should rephrase that to mostly metadata. Because for example, uh, Julia might have the, the idea here to create a publication in Julich data that does have pointers to these large, crazy 10 gigabyte per TIFF file things, but maybe she also wants to store some previews in there, which are way smaller, which you could like scroll around and take a look at. So you would get an idea of how would that 10 gigabyte TIFF file look like when you actually would download it and still have, well, it's more about discoverability. You learn how these files look like and if this data set might be interesting for you. Uh, I'll skip the rest of this slide for the sake of time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm simply go to like, we obviously have now Charlie as well. Um, we need to enable people to upload especially large data, everything that is beyond 300 gigabytes. Um, and here really the crucial aspect is it's not so much about like having more racks full of hard disks. That is not the problem. We have people to do that. We can throw money at this problem. The real problem is the social aspects because free space will always be used and good metadata is hard work. So we need also to do a lot more uh, training, especially for embedded data stewards in the institutes because we need their institutional knowledge to judge on what to keep and what not to keep. And we definitely will apply quotas. So that people do not come uh, to us and say, yeah, sure, I did like 100 terabytes in the last three years of my PhD. I'm leaving tomorrow, so thank you and goodbye. Thanks for all the fish and uh, whatever you do with this. Because that is just going to end up in a landfill. That's no use. We need a better way of doing things. Um, yeah, a lot of other stuff. I'm done. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone. Um, I have the duty to be the last one. Um, I try to not to speed up too much, but <laughs> um, I want to quickly touch on um, on the more practical topic right here because I think you're all like like right now asking yourself like how can I use it, yeah? And I think we're all hackers, and we might be interested in how we can hack into DataVerse and make use of it, yeah? So I want to talk today about some Python libraries that we have, um, one of which is PyDataverse, which is kind of the main one, I would say. And also, I like to live dangerous today, and I would like to give you a live demo, yeah? So pray to the demo gods today. I prayed a lot today, and um, I tested it a lot. It worked, so let's see how that goes, yeah? Okay, so first of all, let's touch on PyDataverse, yeah? So obviously, with, as the name suggests, you know, um, PyDataverse is a Python library to interface with Dataverse, yeah? It was initially developed by Stefan Kasberger until 2021, and from that point on, it kind of, yeah, it, it collected some dust. But recently, in, in the last year, we've um, touched back on it with um, the PyDataverse working group, and we're currently maintaining it and extending it, yeah? So PyDataverse, in a nutshell, yeah, is a one-to-one -one implementation of, of the essential Dataverse endpoints, yeah? Phil already mentioned, like, we have 345 of them. Unfortunately, we don't have the 345 at the moment, but we have the essential ones, but we will have them soon, I'm pretty sure. And um, the thing is, like, PyDataverse in itself, I started with it, actually. That was my first touch point with Dataverse, actually. And it's really popular among these, I want to establish this term, right, data nodes, right here. Um, it has 59 stars on GitHub. It's, it's about the most popular one right there, and it's used by a whooping 72 repositories. As I've already mentioned, you know, PyDataverse touches down on the, I would say, low levels of Dataverse. It's a one-to-one -one implementation of each of these endpoints. And with that, you gain a maximum of control and flexibility. You can do whatever you want with that, yeah? You can combine these endpoints as you wish, and that makes it really nice to develop nice things at the end, yeah? Quite recently, we also supported async requests because like you, sometimes you just wanna do a lot of stuff. You just wanna harvest um, the heck out of a Dataverse installation, and now you can do this with these async requests, yeah? Um, so when you're a data node, yeah? Oh, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm trying to be fast. Oh. Um, when you're data nod, you have all the essentials right there. You can manage your collections, which is a collection of data sets, data sets itself, files, and I think files are the most interesting thing for you today, and other administrative stuff. I don't want to go too deep on that because I just have five minutes left. Whew. <laughs> But there's one thing with using PyDataverse, yeah? and um, there's a caveat on that, and that is due to it being low level to the core, you know, you need to understand the native API, and 345, that's a lot, yeah? And on top of it, you also have to understand these request bodies. Um, I feel like a good example of that, and this is something Phil already mentioned, is a Dataverse JSON. You can see it here on the right, yeah? This, this is required for you to set up metadata on a data set, yeah? And the thing is, it might look like there is a lot of information, but there are a lot of technicalities in there, yeah? The thing is that it's just like reporting on two fields right here. That's the title and that's the author name. It's necessary technically, but as a user, as a researcher, if I'm first encountering that, I'm, I'm like, okay, I need to know all the other stuff, but I'm just interested in those key value relations. Due to that, we are also working on high-level APIs that use PyDataverse to combine things into much more, yeah, how can I put it, like, like um, uh, in, a single com um, in a single concept, yeah? One of which is dynamic metadata objects, which I will touch on, and the other one is like data file uploads to S3. So the first one, dynamic metadata objects, is something that, yeah, tries to solve this problem with the Dataverse JSON right here, yeah? As the, um, as the right-hand side illustration indicates, you know, it's taking these metadata schemes, it bundles it into Python classes and serves it to you as objects, specifically pedantic objects. Um, it stores all these technicalities like the thing you saw in this in this example beforehand in these attributes and takes away all these the other stuff. So you can really focus on um, on setting key value pairs right here, and we we call this kind of a high level um, recipe because it combines multiple endpoints into a simple interface that promotes user friendliness and convenience at the end. Yeah. Another high-level concept that we have, and you can see this nice GIF here at the right hand, um, is the parallelized upload to S3. The upload to S3 is something I would say is a bit more complex than other um, uh, co concepts at Dataverse because it involves a multi multitude of, of endpoints and managing those. We packaged all of this together in the Python and Java DV uploader, so you don't have to take care about this. Yeah, you just pass in the files you want to do an upload for, and you're done. Yeah. And this, again, is also a high-level recipe would be built into this high-level API. It is meant for user-friendliness and usability. We want to make it as easy as possible, yeah? And now we're getting to the dangerous part, yeah? I hope it's not as dangerous as I, as I think. Um, we now want to have a practical example on how we can create a data set on Demo Dataverse and how we can then also update that. For this, I have a Google Colab notebook. Um, I hope these things will, I'm, I'm being fast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, when these slides are shared, you have access to that one. You can try it on your own and, and play around with it. So I hope you're fine with that. Okay, so let's switch to Google Colab. And I would um, go to the safe version because I prepared that actually. <laughs> um, so let's just quickly run down this code and how to do that and how simple it can be. So first of all, you connect to a Dataverse inst installation right here. Yeah? So you have the server URL, you have the API token and everything, and you establish a connection right here. Right at this point, all these metadata schemes are parsed and are already served as these objects. Yeah? So then you can move forward yeah, and create a data set. And I will just skip this one right here. I think this is a detail that... that takes time. Um, you can just create a blank data set and now you have all these metadata blocks and these, these objects now at hand. And I can now say, okay, let's set the title to my data set, add some subjects right here, maybe also add an author and a data set um, description and all the necessary stuff. You see, it's simple. It's, it, you cannot see anything of the complexity of the Dataverse JSON. On the other hand, at the end, we will produce this Dataverse JSON. So you see right here, this is valid, and this will be sent in that way to Dataverse at the end. So it strips away the technicalities and presents you something simple. Yeah. 
Um, there are other stuff. You can look into this if you want uh, with the Google Colab. Another part that is really important is also to add files, yeah? And so it's as convenient as possible that using this DV uploader right here, you just um, have the option to add a file, but also to add a complete um, directory right here, as you can see, and that's it. That's most of the things you need to do. Figuring out to upload it to S3 or not will be done automatically right here. And when you're done with that, yeah, you just simply call the upload function right here. Um, this is a private uh, private um, repository that I have, so you may not be able to use that one, but then you can see it does a check of the data set files, is there something duplicate, and then it uploads everything directly through the S3 storage, and you're done, yeah? So now we can look at this data set right here, and as Phil already showed, a screenshot right here, this is the result of that, yeah? We have all the data that we have right here. We can also look at the tree. The metadata is cool. Of course, this is already the final version with the updated data set, but who cares, it's okay. Um, and that's it, yeah? That's how simple things can get when you work with Dataverse right here. Now, when I want to fetch a data set, I can also do this with this Dataverse instance right here. I can just load this data set with a PID right here, and then I can mess around with that, yeah? I can add new metadata, I can add new files, and then I just have to call the update function to update everything to its state, yeah? And that's actually about it of this demo. Um, when the slides are shared, you can take your time for this Google Colab um, notebook. And I want to quickly advertise that we have a PyDataverse working group. If you want to join, contribute ideas and code, we're totally open to that. There's also a website, pi.gdcc at.io. You find recordings, notes, and everything right there. And we're really active on Zulip, if you know that, because it's the best chat, uh, chat platform, I would say. And with this, I... I want to thank you, and I hope I wasn't too much over time, and um, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think we want to afford uh, some time for some questions, if you have any. Um, we will need the microphone there. Um, any limitations of Dataverse? Let's say S3, I know there is five terabyte, I think, file size limit, or five gigabyte or terabyte? Five gigabyte, I think. So uh, what other limitations? So I cannot upload probably files of that size. Uh, what other limitations of Dataverse? Like uh, iNodes, you've heard about iNodes. Yeah. Would it be a problem? <laughs> Um, how many files in the data set would it slow down the server? You know, right. what do you know about? Um, yes, there are limitations, obviously. Um, like you said, lots of files can be a problem. Um, lots of versions can be a problem. Um, and um, we have a, like a policy of that, that one terabyte for uh, Harvard Dataverse, you know, the, the free storage, right? But in practice, we're not getting uh, lots of huge data sets. I think we're only at 74 terabytes total. So we aren't getting lots of these one terabyte data sets. And I, I suspect people might have some trouble getting the files in place in the first place. Like Jan was showing, uh, these new command line tools, uh, this DV uploader helps a lot because you just point the tool at the directory and it uploads these things. Um, yeah, I don't know. Other challenges, Oliver? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure about that five gigabyte file size limit. Uh, it might be the chunk size. No, no, no. Uh, S3 imposes, I think it's five terabytes. Oh, uh, yeah, that might be. However. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll double check, but there is a physical limit. Like, you cannot have a larger file on S3, so you need to chunk it or something. Yeah. Uh, that's what the Gidanix does. Let's say you need to establish chunk. Yeah, but you can still go ahead and say, okay, if, if this really is a problem for you, um, we now have this, this, this um, I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't say experimental, it's more than experimental, but growing support for remote files. Um, and uh, on one of my slides, I uh, had that challenge of maybe we need a specialized storage driver for a Git Annex, for example, to have a deeper integration, but maybe it's also just good enough to support Git Annex URLs or something. Um, because that would be rather easy to do um, to help mitigate that problem. Just add, I was thinking, like, what are some of the largest data sets that we've seen outside of Harvard Dataverse? Uh, there was one in uh, 
Arizona State University that they, I think is 12 terabytes, and one in uh, KU Levin in Belgium that's more like 18 terabytes. So people are uploading pretty sizable files. Uh, there, there, there are more questions. Should we? Should we? Yeah, yeah. The, so there, there was one uh, by Mika in the chat. Um, is it possible to have collaborative data workflows with Dataverse? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, we have a pretty uh, robust permission system, and so it's actually called Contributor in, in our system. So you would add someone as a contributor, and then they can uh, upload files, edit the metadata. We also have some publishing workflows where sometimes the curator of the collection doesn't want to just hand out the ability to publish. So in that case, the publish button disappears, and you see a um, like, like a request to publish, basically. Mm -hmm. And then the curator receives the data set and either publishes it or returns it back to the author. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I have a, I don't maintain it uh, enough, but I have a, uh, a data set, large-ish, I don't know, a few hundred gigabytes on a Dataverse instance in the Netherlands. And it, it has custom access requirements. So, you, so essentially, all of the files are set to not accessible. Mm -hmm. And then people need to uh, requ uh, like re use the request access button. And I think the instance was on the previous version, so not the latest <laughs> database version. But there was quite some difficulties building, uh, ideally, an automated pipeline around um, requesting access reviewing that and then granting that um, by the API at that point. And I think I used uh, by Dataverse. Um, so I was just wondering if, if you have more recent developments and if there are existing um, uh, so, uh, like sample use cases to point to where people have actually done this kind of round trip of um, not just by pushing, uh, mm -hmm. clicking on buttons uh, to grant access to perhaps the full data set as one or sub, some files within a data set. Right, right. So you should be able to assign the permission of file down, that's called a file downloader internally, uh, to the person who's asking for permission to one file. You, you could assign that permission to the person for the whole data set, which would include all the files underneath it. Um, all the APIs, well, I'm not sure how new they are, but um, you're saying you were able to find APIs for doing this, and, and just that no, you were. That was not. This was several years ago. Okay. Well, there are APIs for that now, and the good news about APIs is that we keep talking, talking about 345 or whatever. But we're actually rewriting the entire front end of Dataverse in React, which means that anything that wasn't possible to do via API, we have to make it possible. <laughs> so. Pretty soon, uh, all functionality of Dataverse will be possible via API. I think I think that 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 is worth considering. The, the, so. <laughs> I just quickly want to add, yeah, you mentioned that you've used PyDataverse for that. And the thing is, like, PyDataverse just has, like, like 37 of these endpoints implemented right there. We're currently working on a solution that you have all these endpoints right there. And I guess, like, that you haven't found it, I think, maybe partly a reason because it wasn't in PyDataverse in itself, yeah? yeah? That might be the issue, but we're working on that, yeah. Awesome. Um, you will be around for the for the hackathon tomorrow, right? Except and, me. And and so there's there's more room for for more. Um, we we uh, you know thank you for 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 the for the presentation and. Uh, <laughs>